Welcome back, everybody. Before we begin our panel discussion, I'd like us to just bow our heads and we'll invite the good Lord's presence. Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us back this evening as we round off this, uh, this symposium. We ask again for your presence to be in this house, that you would bless each one of us. And uh, bless our panel as we uh, uh, discuss a few final things, ask a few questions, Look forward to some enlightening and inspiring answers, so be with us now, and thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, are we ready? Good. All right. Uh, here's the first question I'd like to pose here. In a nutshell, what is the emerging church movement, or how could we perhaps define it or describe it? And uh, Dustin, uh, I'd like you to uh, address this for us, if you would. I don't know that I would necessarily, um, necessarily want to define it, but what I'd like to do is point out one of um, the most dangerous aspects of this movement, and it's dangerous because it's so subtle. And that is that um, this, this movement is based on the evangelical gospel. And what I mean by that, it's based on a gospel that says that you and I, the sons and daughters of God, will be sinning until Jesus comes. That is the most dangerous and subtle aspect of this movement. Um, listen to what uh, Dave Fiedler quotes um, Ellen White in his book, um, Tremble, and it's from Sermons and Talks, uh, Volume 1. She says about Living Temple, the Living Temple, the book that... Um, that uh, Kellogg wrote, in the living temple the assertion is made that God is in the flower, in the leaf, in the center. Now you think that she might go on and address the leaf and the flower, but she doesn't. She address, addresses the um, topic of the center. She keys in on that point, not the pantheism, what we might think is pantheism, but she addresses the center aspect. And she goes on to say, but God does not live in the center, the Word declares that He abides only in the hearts of those that love Him and do His commandments, or that do righteousness, I'm sorry. God does not abide in the heart of the sinner. It is the enemy who abides there. First John 3, 9 states, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. This is why I believe this, um, this movement is so dangerous, and that's the aspect I think is the most dangerous. Okay, Dustin, thank you. I've actually I've just uh, been reminded I need to introduce the panel for those of you who haven't been here before. Immediately on my left is Pastor Steve Wahlberg from Whitehorse Ministry. We have Janet Newman from Walla Walla. Uh, we have Alexa Hernandez from Utah. Jerry... Uh, Jerry Wagner from, of course, Ad Vindicate, which you saw, and Dustin Butler. Du Dustin is from not too far away. He's uh, from California. Pastor Stephen Ball. Uh, a lot of you re recognize Pastor Ball. He's a um, pastor in the Central California Conference. He's also president and key speaker of Secrets Un Unsealed. Uh, Don Riley. Um, he hasn't spoken yet. He will for a little while on the panel here. He's on the faculty of Walla Walla University, and we're glad you're here, uh, Dr. Riley. And also, of course, um, Danny Striever, who has many titles. Uh, the one we'll settle for this afternoon is the, he's from Remnant Publications and also uh, one of the main coordinators of this event. And on the far left, my far left, is uh, Dave Fiedler, who... Uh, spoke just uh, this afternoon. He's a former school teacher and a freelance writer. So there you have the panel. So let's move on with the second question here. Um, we hear a lot about spiritual formation. What exactly is spiritual formation? I'd like to add to this question. Uh, if we could describe as well what actually happens, what does somebody do as they're actually engaging in a mystical, 
exercise, what does it do in and for the mind, and what are the dangers of this? And uh, Pastor Wahlberg, you were our first speaker last night. I wonder if you care to address this for us. It's a, it's a confusing term to a lot of people, spiritual formation. Now, if you just take the words at face value, we know what spiritual means. I want to be a spiritual person, so do you. And formation simply means forming something into something else. So the words individually by themselves just have their own basic meaning. But the problem is that putting them together, spiritual formation, uh, is a, a package term that basically... Uh, results, according to Jan Markovic at uh, Andrews University and a lot of research that we've both done, it basically comes as a package, as part of, as a pathway of spiritual growth that involves spiritual disciplines. This is another term. Spiritual formation involves spiritual disciplines. Now, the spiritual disciplines have to do with a path of doing certain things to supposedly find God and to find His presence. Uh, they're based on on the simplest terms, really just have to do with reading the Bible, praying, and, uh, and meditating. But what happens is that these simple activities are connected in the process of spiritual disciplines with a whole, whole host of other things like, uh, as they say, I don't know exactly exact if I'm saying this right, lesio or lectio, lecio, okay, something like that, lecio divina, which involves reading the Bible and then repeating again and again and again and again certain Bible words or other phrases, saying them over and over again. Uh, in the book Hunger by Dr. John Dibdahl, he refers to another, or he, he refers to here as, this is page 52, Francis of Assisi reputedly prayed all night just saying, Jesus, my Jesus. He said those words over and over and over and over again. Another spiritual discipline or practice has to do with what people call breath prayers. And Dr. Dibdahl said here in his book, again, page 52, inhale Jesus' peace or love and exhale fear or pain. The simple concentration on breathing and the reception of love and the expelling of pain makes a real difference to people and brings a sense of God's presence. That's called breath prayer. So you just breathe in and think of certain things and breathe out, and supposedly that will bring you into the presence of God. Uh, another practice of, of the spiritual disciplines is entering the silence or centering down where you eventually empty your mind, try to empty your mind so that you can then encounter God, uh, which is a very, very dangerous practice. The, the ultimate biggest danger of, uh, of entering the silence is that you turn your brain off and you open yourself up to whoever or whatever chooses to come in. And they believe that it's God that comes in, but I don't. Uh, Ellen White makes it clear that those who accept spiritualistic philosophies will end up in a position where the devil can talk directly to them and lead them astray. It's very dangerous. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Pastor Steve. Uh, another question here. Uh, it's one thing to speak about this outside of the church, but of course the concerns are that it's already infiltrated the church. Um, but the question is, what do you suppose is the underlying reason why many Adventists have been drawn into the emerging church movement? I'll just put this out generally to the, to the panel here. So if you want to speak, uh, address that. And now is your moment. Comment while they're thinking about it. Yeah. I think a lot of people are, search, are moving into this movement because they're searching for something and their a Christian experience is not working. So they're looking for something else. And unknown to themselves that when they are tempted to move in this direction, they're really uh, placing themselves on a pathway that is leading them to the devil and not the Lord. Danny? A piggyback. A piggyback. You must be born again. Justification by faith. If you experience justification by faith, you are born again. What one word would you describe your experience in that experience? Love, joy, peace. If you don't have peace, if you're not born again, you're going to go looking for peace in all the wrong places. 
But what is one of the, even if you have that truth and have that message and you have the books and you have the Bible, do you think one of the, pre, one of the reasons is we're so busily preoccupied maybe with social media, certain other things, we don't take the time to study and read and something comes along and it just seems kind of easy, it doesn't particularly challenge us, it doesn't present a, a, a religion where there's a cross to carry. Do you think that might play into some of this as well? David? If I can go back to my illustration from a couple meetings back, I, I think for a hundred years we've been floating in a lifeboat, dying of starvation and dehydration. Mm -hmm. um, I have to take very seriously when Ellen White says that if you separate the medical and the, the evangelistic, it places the worst evil on the churches. And in practice, for most of us, I think that what that has done is it separated the laity from the sense of a mission. You know, we have it kind of a sort of a thing, but, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that I think one of the first things that, that really happened when we started slowing down, dying down, is we became protective of our young people. You know, it used to be that missionaries would go out and a large percentage of them would die. And that's a, that's a high cost. But, you know, the blood of missionaries is seed. And if, if you do nothing but what is safe as a Christian, that you can see to be safe, you'll do nothing. And, and that's the direction we have, we have drifted. And especially for young people. I spent my life, you know, most of my, my teaching years working with, with teenagers. They want a challenge. They don't want pablum. And, and, you know, they want intensity. And so what we've done is we've substituted the intensity of a real challenge. We've substituted the intensity of a rock band. That's not a good trade. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Good point. Okay, let's move on here, uh, looking at the issue, but what can we do to counteract emergent theology and the trappings that would come with it? Uh, Dustin, you, you started off this afternoon. Maybe you'd like to address that as well. I, to answer your question, I don't know. But what I do know is that we should not handle this movement like we handled Desmond Ford mm -hmm. in 79. Um, what we did with Desmond Ford is we managed a symptom. And what we have here are symptoms. We pointed out a lot of symptoms today and last night. But what we need is a cure. And um, again, I'll go back to um, the actual disease. What we have is um, the evangelical gospel in this church. It's being preached from our pulpits, and it is not the everlasting gospel. And if you wonder what the evangelical gospel is, go to Audioverse and type in evangelical and Adventist and listen to everything you find on that topic. Hmm. You'll find out what the difference is very quickly, what the difference is between an evangelical and a Seventh-day Adventist. Hmm. And I'll just quickly go over three points that, that uh, are taught in this gospel. Original sin, the first one, which holds that we are guilty for Adam's sin at our birth. Point two, the idea that justification alone is required for salvation and sanctification plays no role in that. Point three, the belief that once a believer is justified, this extends indefinitely into the future. And the only way that we can lose that justification is if we reject Jesus and not by open and willing sin. This, this, what I, this is what I believe is the solution is um, to make sure that we don't handle it like we, we have done in the past. Mm. Thank you. Janet? Yeah, please. Uh, something that I have seen, uh, have witnessed in several different churches in my community is the fact that many people sit and listen to sermons that are filled with emergent church authors, quotations, even exact quote sermons from emergent church books. And they sit there quietly and as though they're mesmerized. Um, they, it's as though they're letting the, the waters waft over them. It's nice and warm water, and it's comforting. And there is not a lot of thought process going in. I, I truly believe that there are many in the church that are hearing these messages, and they have no idea what they are hearing. And that is, the, that is basically a Laodicean concept and if this is going to be changed, people have got to do independent study. I said something last night that I have never in my life said publicly before. 
and because I don't speak against my church. But in this day and age, I don't believe that we can sit in a pew in a Seventh-day Adventist church and feel like every pastor is going to give us a full Seventh-day Adventist gospel. And as individuals sitting in our pews, as laity, not theologians, not scholars, not authors, just plain laity, and that's all I am, we have to go home and verify everything we hear from the pulpit with the Bible. If we do not do our independent study, we are going to be deceived. And this is not to say this is happening in every Seventh-day Adventist church. But I moved from one Seventh-day Adventist church to another because I was hearing totally emergent messages regularly. I talked to the pastor about it several times, personally as well as through letters. And he made the comment to me when I talked to him about emergent church theology, and he says, well, what is that? And I named off a half a dozen different emergent church theologians, and he said to me, oh, I've read them all, and they're wonderful. And then I said, well, if, what do you do then with the mixture of truth and error in those books? And he said, I take the good things and I leave the bad. And then I asked him, how do you reconcile that then with Isaiah 8.20? unto the law and the testimony. If it speaks not, according to these, there is no light in them. Uh, and he looked at me with a blank look on his face, and he said, well, I guess you've got a good point there. This was in my home. And he was out the door in 30 seconds. He did not want to deal with that kind of an issue. Uh, if we cannot pick and choose materials and take the good out of, if it's mixed with the bad because there's no light in them. The scriptures say it. Mrs. White says it. Go home and study for yourself. Take notes in church. Write down the quotations you hear. And then go ahead and verify. You can Google any author that you hear and find out what they truly believe. Thank you, Janet. Pastor Paul. The big question is, where is it coming from? You can't solve the problem unless you know where it's coming from. And by my observations, this is coming from non-Adventist seminaries where our scholars have studied, and then they train our pastors, and then our pastors introduce it into the Adventist church. And until that problem is solved, we're not going to be able to really solve the problem. Um, I'd like to mention, and Dave probably can identify with this. I've read your book, by the way. Very good book, Tremble. Ellen White, for a long time, refused to read the Living Temple. The prophet of the Lord refused to read the Living Temple of Kellogg. And her son had to insist, almost twist her arm to the breaking point. You need to read this book to find out what Kellogg is teaching. Now the question is, if God's prophet felt, very, felt, felt a huge amount of fear at reading a book that was filled with mysticism and pantheism, what about at our seminaries where these books are being given to our young people who have no theological foundation to evaluate these things on the basis of. So there has to be a change at the source. Okay, somebody in a home church. Um, I'm speaking here of an individual. This is the question. What do I do if my home church is drifting into this movement? Just an individual person. What, what can they do? Pastor Ball, you got any thoughts on that? Well, I get all kinds of emails and phone calls and snail mail letters asking this question. It shows me that it's a big problem. In fact, I get emails from people saying, I don't have a place to go to church anymore. 
And that's sad. And so they ask, what, what should I do? Well, basically, the Bible tells us what the process is. First of all, you go and talk to the pastor. If the pastor doesn't listen, then you take it to the board of the elders. If the elders don't listen, then you take it to a church business session. Eventually, there's going to be a church business session. And inform the church. And if it doesn't work there, then you need to speak to the conference officers about what's happening in the local church. That's a process that God tells us to follow. Now, if at each step the individuals are, um, I probably shouldn't use the word defiled, but I will, by these emerging church ideas, then, you know, the person might have to change churches, you know, just for their own spiritual welfare and so that they can be fed. Uh, but that, I would say, would be the last resort. Mm. Yeah. David? Somebody told me a long time ago there are only two ways to change the church, education and evangelism. So if you think about it, that's what, that's what changes the, the, the mindset, the composition of our membership, is the people you bring in and the people that are coming up that you educate. So I would suggest if you really want to change something, what you should do is become the teacher conducting a field school of evangelism. We need lots of those. At the root of the, post, of the emerging church movement is postmodern thinking. And postmodern thinking is characterized by the idea that truth is subjective. Truth is not found in a book. Truth is found inside of you. And your truth might be different than my truth, but we both have the truth. <laughs> you know, what happens is, you know, going back to Kellogg, you know, this is really camouflage spiritualism and pantheism because basically Kellogg's ideas taken to their extreme means that uh, your ethical system and my ethical system are just as acceptable because we are both part of the universal essence of God. So what makes your de ethical decisions better than mine if we're both God? Are you understanding me? So ultimately, the devil's intention is to get rid of objective truth, to take away the standard by which we can evaluate everything to see if it is true or not. That is at the bottom line of what the devil is trying to do. Tell us again in a, in a, in a nutshell, Jerry, what is the social gospel and is it a part of Christ's ministry? Good question. By the way, have any of you been to GYC? That's one of the best things going in our church right now. It's a wonderful ministry to young people. And whether it's intentional or not, the one project has positioned itself to be the rival or at least an alternative to GYC. GYC is the best thing happening right now. Okay, social justice or the social gospel. First of all, it's an ill-defined term. Um, Whole books have been written about it, as I mentioned earlier, that they really failed to define it. Uh, Jim Wanless uh, positions himself to be one of the premier authorities and uh, disciples of it in Washington. He is the founder of Sojourners Ministry, and he's even hesitant at times to be able to define what it really is. Now, some people genuinely want to help others. That's good. That's a good thing. But we must never elevate physical needs over spiritual needs. Jesus didn't do that. He did a lot of good. And we've learned from that, and we've been drawn to that picture of him in the gospel. But he always elevated the spiritual destiny of a person over their, over their physical needs. Everyone that Jesus healed died eventually. It also leads to confusion in the church, I believe confusion over the role of the church. Now these things take wisdom to discern. They take time to understand. Let's look at the book of Acts if you want to understand social justice. The church's primary function is charisma in Greek, and that is the proclamation of the gospel. That is an essential message. 
And that's something that only the church can do. That was the sentiment behind the disciples, I believe, in the distribution of food when there came a need to provide food for those that didn't have it. Realizing this, they said, we cannot forsake the proclamation of the gospel to wait on tables. Didn't mean it wasn't important. It meant that the proclamation of the gospel was preeminent. So the church must do what only it can do. No one else can do this. The church cannot be diverted into, into only a food pantry because that won't help anyone. It'll keep them alive for a little while longer, but it won't help them reach the kingdom of heaven. And that's not love if we neglect the gospel. Um, we need to move on here pretty fast. Uh, I'd like to address this question to Dave Fiedler. David, do you believe that postmodernism and the emergent church movement, do you believe it's what Ellen White referred to as the Omega? Historically, of all the things that have been suggested as the possibility of the Omega over the years, and that, that the suggestion started up in 1907, you can point to about five or six different things. This is the only one that falls in the ballpark. Is this really the Omega? You know, I will never underestimate the devil's ability to make things worse. Um, and, and, you know, I, I know that sounds that's silly, but, but seriously, the Omega, I think Ellen White was trembling for the people in this audience, too. We have not seen hell turned loose yet. We may be on the road. Don, you've got two minutes, then I'm going to conclude with Pastor Ball. All right. My first year when I came to Walla Walla Start Teaching, which was about 23 years ago, the year before that, I worked in a government laboratory where they brought in philosophers from California, Berkeley University, to tell people how to how to open their mind and think more clearly and, and, uh, and, and, and make better decisions, this sort of thing. And it was, it was so bad, they ultimately got run out. But it was less than a year later. I'm at Walla Walla, and I get a flyer in the mail from my church that says there's going to be a power of the Holy Spirit symposium taking place in a week or two. And I read that thing, and I realized everything I had just heard the previous year from worldly scholars, California, Berkeley, is now being brought into my church, except the words were being changed, not how to, you know, improve your mind to make better decisions on designing something, because I'm an engineer, but the answer was how to improve your mind to give better Bible studies. And as I read through that, seeing this, this clever choice of words, I said, there is something behind this that isn't right. I hadn't gone to it yet. It was just an announcement. I said, I'm going to call this pastor up, and I'm going to say, help me understand where you get your ideas from. Called him on the phone. The phone conversation went like this. First question, are you the pastor coming to this church, the largest church of the Upper Columbia Conference, to put this seminar on? The answer was yes. Question number two, have you been trained in neuro-linguistic programming? And he said, no, I have not. Question three, for you to come and teach this, you would have had to have been trained in the so-called train the trainer seminar, NLP Lab 2, to be qualified to teach this subject. Have you been trained in NLP Lab 2, train the trainer? And his answer was, no, I have not. My next comment was, I have a document in front of me with all of the Seventh-day Adventist ministers who have been trained in Lab 1 and Lab 2 of NLP, and your name is on it. So where are you getting your ideas for this seminar? He paused and then said, sorry, I lied to you. I have been trained in Lab 1. I've been trained in Lab 2. And, um, and so what was this man's job? Well. I looked up recently what his job is. At the time, I think he was ministerial director for the conference, formerly assistant to the North American Division president. Currently, last night, we saw his name on the board from Alexa. 
adjunct professor of spiritual formation, Andrews University. This, it, it, it's important that we understand truth, we know where to go to get it, and we can see it and respond to it when this happens. I want to close with one last thought, and that is when Alex uh, left pastor of the University Church and, and went to Ohio, there was a new pastoral search committee formed to replace him. And there was a pastor that came and, and gave a talk from California. His picture was also showed uh, today. And I, I listened to that, and within two minutes, I said, there's some problems here. I said, I'm going to start taking some notes. I stopped after 10 minutes because I had reached problem number five of belittling the doctrines of the Adventist church from the pulpit of the university church. When I got to number five, I said, that's enough. I went home. I wrote an email to the chair of the search committee for the, for the pastor. And I said, you cannot consider this man to be our next pastor. But if all we did was to say something negative, I would think we're doing something wrong. My email said, don't consider this man to be the next pastor. And I provided a list of 12 pastors who could be good candidates. Pastor Ball, you've got two minutes. <laughs> Sounds a bit repetitious, I know, but just uh, how does the emerging church movement impact the present truth message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? We've kind of heard the answer, but just crystallize it in summary here. <laughs> I know the answer. I you know the answer. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Before I answer that question, I just want to say the power of the Seventh day Adventist Church is in the membership. It's not in the conference, it's not in the union. It's not in the seminaries. It's in you. You've been here. You've heard this. Now you have to speak up to the powers that be and say, it's time to put a stop to this. Now, let me answer your question. Be nice, though. Be nice. In order to answer that question, we need to understand what present truth is. The way that we determine what present truth is, is by finding out where Jesus is and what he's doing now. You see, when he came to this earth in the camp, he came to live a perfect life. That was present truth. When he went into the court, his death and resurrection was present truth. When he went to the, most holy, to the holy place to intercede upon his ascension, that was present truth. That's what pre uh, Peter preached about. But now Jesus is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And everything relating to the most holy place is present truth. The distinctive doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church are found in the most holy place. The law, the Sabbath, health reform, the manna. One of the lessons is health reform. The idea of the judgment, particularly the judgment of the living Cleansing the soul temple as Jesus is cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. The state of the dead is contained there. You say, how's that? Well, you know, if people go to heaven or hell when they die, why would you need a judgment that begins in 1844? They were all re rewarded when they died. So the doctrine of the, of the state of the dead of the Adventist church is centered in the most holy place. That is is present truth. I'd just like to mention that I wrote this book called Worship at Satan's Throne, where I analyze Ellen White's vision from early writings, pages 54 to 56. It's a scary vision, where she says that there were multitudes worshiping at a throne in the holy place. To make a long story short, the Father and the Son both moved into the most holy place small group of people that had their eyes on Jesus moved with Jesus into the most holy place by faith. But she says that the majority of people stayed worshiping at the, at the throne in the holy place. Satan took the place that Christ vacated. And the people prayed, Father, give us your spirit. And the devil breathed upon them an evil influence, 
which they thought was the power of God, but it was the power of the enemy. The disturbing part of this vision is not in early writings, actually. It's in a second letter that she wrote to Enoch Jacobs, where she says that she saw one after another that had gone with Jesus into the most holy place, backtrack, and go and kneel in the holy place, and they receive the, inf the evil influence of Satan. That has to be Adventists that went into the most holy place with Christ. And they backtrack to worship the way the Christian world worships. And so present truth is what is in the most holy place, the distinctive truths of the Adventist church, which will be the points of controversy at the end of time, the state of the dead, the law, and the Sabbath. Thank you very much, Pastor Ball. Thank you for the final word. It's time to conclude. Pastor Steve, would you please uh, offer a prayer first, then Pastor Chris will come up and dismiss everybody. Please. Dear Father in heaven, Father, we pray at the end of this incredible weekend, we pray for your people. We pray for your church. We pray for the leaders of the One Project. We pray for those that are involved in this this deception that is leading away from Jesus, the real Jesus, and the Bible, and the three angels' messages. We pray for ourselves that you will give us wisdom to know what to do. And we pray that, above all, we will lift up Jesus Christ, His righteousness, His love, His cross, and the message that Jesus is coming again. Lord, bless us and guide your people all the way until the end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Pastor Chris. Thank you.